comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 12, beginning at verse 1. Hear the word of God. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold in the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. We ask now that your spirit would give us understanding, open up our hearts, open up our minds to the depths of the truths held within your word. And Lord, as we begin to understand, help us to grow spiritually. For we know that as we grow spiritually, our lives become better. Our, our lives become fuller and, and more whole. So we thank you for your word this morning, Lord, and we thank you for your spirit who teaches us through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We human beings break easily. Last Sunday I was running along a sidewalk down in Bridgeport, and there was a bolt sticking up out of the ground, and they'd taken some lampposts out and left the bolt sticking up for me. My foot hit the bolt, and down I went, I landed smack on my face. Now, luckily, you can't do much damage to, to this face of mine. I'm, I'm glad I didn't break a rib. I've fallen before and I've broken ribs. So often, I visit older people at the hospital who have fallen and broken a, a wrist or hips or ribs. These bodies that we have are very fragile, especially as we age. But even young people get hurt. In sports and, and other activities. These bodies are, are just fragile. But it's not only our bodies that get broken. Our feelings get hurt at the drop of a hat. Our self-esteem is very fragile. Someone may insult us and we take that inside and, and we hurt and so we fire back and, and to say something to them, and then the battle is on. Back and forth it, it, it goes. The sad thing is these kinds of, of battles create a brokenness within. There were twin brothers who started a business together, a hardware store. One day, one of the brothers left a dollar bill on the cash register. Then he went outside because he wanted to talk to a customer. When he came back in, that dollar bill was gone. So he went up to his twin brother and he said, Did you take that dollar bill that was sitting there? His brother said, No, I, I didn't even see a dollar bill there. Well, the other brother said, Dollars just don't get up and walk away. And an argument broke out over this dollar bill. Day after day, this enmity festered between the two. They got to the point where they had to divide the store in half. The one brother took took care of the tools and the electric side of the store. The other brother took care of the painting and the plumbing side of the store. And they barely spoke to one another. Twenty years later, an old man walked into the store and he put a $20 bill down on the counter and both brothers stopped and looked at this old guy. The old man said, 20 years ago I came into this place. I was a vagrant. I was hungry. I had no money. He said, no one was around and there was a dollar bill right there on the cash register, so I took it. I felt guilty ever since. So I wanted to pay that back with interest with this $20 bill and say how sorry I am. The brothers looked at one another and cried 
because suddenly they realized that their relationship had been broken for 20 years over a one dollar bill. That's the funny thing though about brokenness. It can start with something very small and insignificant, but it grows like chokeweed in a garden. The brokenness isn't limited to our bodies and to our feelings. We can become broken through our habits. We neglect our health. We abuse drugs. We abuse food. We abuse alcohol. And then we wonder why we feel the way we do. Now, believe it or not, I have something good to say about brokenness. God knows how we are. God knows that we often ignore what God wants us to do or what He is saying to us because we want to go in our own direction. So often, God will wait until we reach that point of utter brokenness. Often, it is only in our brokenness that we finally allow God to begin working in our lives. And so, God patiently waits until the light comes on in our mind and we realize how much we need God's power released in our lives. Now with the Israelites, it took 70 years of brokenness before they began to really listen to what God was trying to tell them. And when they were ready, they began to remember all that God had done in the past with their ancestors, when their ancestors were held in captivity in Egypt, how God worked in their lives through the prophet Moses, and then how God led them out of Egypt and separated the Red Sea as they crossed into freedom, and then how the sea collapsed upon their enemies. So in their brokenness, they began to believe in the possibilities of God. How would God deliver them from Babylon? Would He do it in the same way that He did with Moses? They began believing that God could deliver them. Would He separate the sea like He did for Moses? Well, this is how the, uh, the prophet Isaiah responded to them. Isaiah said, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. The wild animals honor me, the jackals and the owls, because I provide water in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland to give drink to my people, my chosen, the people I form for myself, that they may proclaim my praise. So Isaiah informed the Israelites that instead of separating the waters of the sea so that they could escape their enemies, God was going to do something new. It would be a reversal. The Israelites would have to travel hundreds and hundreds of miles through the desert to get back to Jerusalem. God promised he would send streams into the desert, into the wasteland. He said even the jackals and the owls and the other wild animals would be thankful for all that God was about to do. And so the Israelites, in their brokenness, opened up to the possibilities of God by faith, and they trusted in those prophetic words from Isaiah. And after Persia conquered Babylon and released the Israelites to go back to the promised land, they made this great trip. From there in Babylon, down, around, and through the desert, and God provided for them every step of the way. It was a journey back to Jerusalem, a journey of faith, a journey of hope, a journey of rehabilitation. Through their brokenness, God released His power. Streams in the desert to provide for them. The Spirit to lead them. Now in the New Testament, in several gospel accounts in the New Testament, we discover a very symbolic act of something being broken so that something very powerful can be released. 
in Mark chapter 14. We're told that a woman takes this alabaster jar of pure nard, which was a very expensive perfume. And she took that jar of nard and she broke it and it released this powerful fragrance throughout the whole house. And then she took the nard and she anointed Jesus with it. Now, in, in the other account, in John's account of it, John chapter 12, this is what we read. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. So here in John's Gospel, we discover exactly who this woman is. It's Mary, not Mary, the mother of Jesus, not uh, Mary Magdalene, but Mary, the sister of Lazarus and Martha. Now, not many days before this, Jesus had raised her brother Lazarus from the dead. So Mary's act of taking the most precious thing she owned, this pipe jar of nard, and breaking it, and then pouring it on to Jesus' feet to anoint him was an act of commitment and an act of discipleship. This was an act of expressing her love for her Lord, the one who raised her brother from the dead. Now, how do we know that this act was an expression of discipleship, of calling Jesus Lord? Well, when you think about it, who was anointed? in the Old Testament. Kings were anointed. Samuel anointing young David who would become king. Mary was saying, you are my king, Jesus. You are the Messiah. I trust you. I am committed to you. Now there was one disciple who raised great objections to this act. And who was that? Judas. He said, why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. And it seems like Judas is very socially concerned about the poor. But then in verse 6, we get his, his motive. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. See, Mary broke that jar, and she anointed Jesus because she herself was broken. She no longer wanted her ego. She no longer wanted her selfishness to direct her life anymore. She no longer wanted self-rule in her heart, but rather she was at the point where she wanted to make Jesus the Lord so that Jesus could direct her life. She was ready to follow Christ. Judas did just the opposite. He wanted more for himself. His selfishness, his ego was not willing to be broken so that Jesus would be Lord of his life. So he refused to let Jesus rule from the throne of his heart. Because of her brokenness, Mary experienced the release of God's power in her life. She became a spirit-empowered person. Because Judas wanted to remain in control of that throne of his heart, he rejected the Lord. He rejected Jesus as king. And God's power was not released in his life. And we know what happened to Judas. No matter where he fled, he couldn't escape himself. And his self was his worst enemy. A fatal enemy. As we continue in John's account, that we discover Mary's anointing of Jesus had another purpose. John 12, 7 and 8 says, Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. With these words, the shadow of the cross fell upon this dinner celebration. In biblical times, Nard was not only used to anoint kings, but it was also used to anoint the dead. Mary's act of anointing him reminded Jesus that the cross awaited him. On this fifth Sunday in Lent, may the shadow of the cross fall upon us in order to be broken 
We must die to self. We must die to that attitude that Judas embraced. What's in it for me? I want to do it my way. Only when we learn to die to self, only when self is broken, will God release his power in our lives, the power of the Holy Spirit. And then, only then, we will know how it feels to be whole.